the write-up for this, there's a thing about like what's the worst that could happen, and maybe not having a CEO to do strategy at is the worst thing that could happen, unless you approach things more often than not as something like that happening, just being a new creative constraint, which is what I've tried to do, because every now and then I can be optimistic, not very often. So what we're gonna do today is, can we go back to the start of the presentation? Uh, I'm going to run you through about an hour of content in 15 minutes, and then we're going to work together. Now, there's a bit of distance here. I know there aren't microphones, so that when I interact with you, first of all, you're safe. Uh, second of all, uh, I want you just to kind of yell things at me if I look towards you so that we can move quickly, because I never know what's going to happen. I don't think, I'm, I don't think we're going to look foolish because I'm making you the CEO of whichever company we end up working on. All right? So it's going to be a bit of fun. Uh, before I forget, also, I just want to give a big shout out to the Curious crew for having us. I think they've been an amazing host. It's a beautiful conference. Uh, first time in Mumbai. I feel very fortunate to be here. And often the people who organize things and who make everything happen don't get, get an applause. So let's, can we give them all an applause? So as this, is, as this is happening, this is creative constraints, right? Blank screen, page, what could go wrong? Uh, we're going to make a decision, because we're going to do some strategy today, and we're either going to pick uh, Amul from yesterday, A-M-U-L, right? That's the big Indian brand, or my mullet. Okay, so you're the CEOs, you're either going to be the CEOs of uh, my mullet, it's a bit new, which means we're going to have some fun, or you're going to choose Amul, and we're also going to have some fun. Uh, and that way that, you, you, this is going to be a brand that you all understand, and you're going to be responsible for the output. I'll do the drawings because I have the pen. Um, so this is, this is called Strategy of the Workout. This is some of my favorite material. I'm not going to go through too many frameworks, but I am going to get you thinking. If you have pens, I am going to give you some exercises, pens and pencils, so please use them. This gentleman's name is Andre Apiello. I'm, I should stand over here, shouldn't I? Can you see him? He's got beautiful hair. Andre Apiello, very famous Italian football player. He moved to New York, I live in New York, and about five, years in, sorry, about five years into my time in New York, he had just moved there, and he was interviewed a few months into his playing in Major League Soccer, which is the main professional competition in the USA, what it's like playing in the USA. And he said this, a lot of running, too little play. And it broke my heart. I was like, finally, somebody who understands me. I moved to New York to do great work at scale, found that very, very difficult, and I find my truth from a man with beautiful hair from Italy, one of Italy's most famous footballers of the last 10 years. And this has sort of become a little... Uh, uh, just pretend that that hand there is waving at you to make the uh, presentation more friendly. So again, another creative constraint. So what I took this out, there's a few ways that I look at this. Like, what's going on? We have totally lost our focus. And I felt that for some, for some time when I was not very okay at what I was doing when I was learning, that I was in an operating system that was really, really good. I think Sydney, where I'm from, is actually quite... Uh, I think it's a pretty high-performing, or Australia, New Zealand, that area is a pretty high-performing creative culture. We are in the middle of nowhere. It's the same with cricket. We want to be good at the things that we choose to be good at, and there are probably six and a half of them. And uh, so we work hard, and we, we're quite cheeky and irreverent. And so you see that in the advertising work that, that we do and that we grow up with. And we just expect to do good work. People do want to win awards at Cannes. Uh, and then you go to New York, and you think that a lot of that's going to travel, and then you have culture shock for five years, where with an accent, you get rolled out into meeting rooms as a court jester. We'll get the strategy planning people. I use strategy very liberally, and I do it on purpose. So don't, if, if you've got issues with words, don't have issues with those, those words. I know, what, I know what I'm doing. I'm a responsible strategy word user. Um, and the other thing, so the other thing about this is like that, that word in general, the main part of this metaphor, because now I'm going to mess with it, is focus. What game are we playing? What are we here to do? How do we spend our days to do the thing that we're here to do? And if we're here to do good work that's effective, if we're here to learn, why are we in meetings for 10 hours a day and sending emails at 1 a.m.? That does not seem very scientific. I'm more into pseudoscience, but that does not seem very scientific. The second thing here that we're forgetting, I feel, I don't know what it's like here, although I get messages and emails and DMs, so I appreciate that, is the word play. This is supposed to be a playful act. What I'm doing right now is how I like to play because I'm strange. What we are doing is play, and I feel that what's been happening, uh, especially with the capital B business sensibility, the capital B business culture that's going on, the number of MBAs that are around right now in marketing teams, which is amazing, 
um, I feel like we're getting shamed out of this. And now we're worried about, if you're in the agency world, we're worried about the management consultants and the people who can do counting numbers things really well. And now they, oh, you, you, you're just the words and pictures people. And we've been through these cycles before, but it feels really strong. We've lost our, like, our, our, our strength and our soul a little bit. And then the third thing, as far as focus, is the idea of practice. So many of us, we go to university, and a lot of us think we're fully formed, and I know that because I've hired a lot of like, people coming out of college. I go to colleges, Miami Ad School, I've seen how people present portfolios to me. I'm like, you're 10 years away from what you think you're away from. Are you writing right now? Are you drawing right now? Are you doing stand-up comedy right now? Are you painting? Are you practicing? Or you just think you're fully formed, you've got your portfolio, and now you're the CEO? It's not how it works. Focusing on the right things, play and practice. Super, super important. This is a brick. Does everybody have a pen and a pencil? We did some of this yesterday, but I am so passionate about this stuff that we're going to do it again in case you're in that session. I'm now going to time you a little bit, though. This is a brick. I'm going to give you 30 seconds, and I want you to write down five ways that you can use a brick that do not involve building a building. Okay? 30 seconds. Write it down. I want to see everybody writing. This is your practice. It's Friday night. How can you use a brick that does not involve building a building? I feel I'm yelling at you. There's passion, by the way. There's passion. And you're also a long way away. How can you use a brick in ways that do not involve building a building? We're flying. We're flying. You're going to get about a quarter of it, and then I'm putting you to work. This, academically, is known as Guilford's Alternative Uses Test. In my mind, it's always from 1957. It could be 1958, 1967. It's from a while ago. And it might horrify some people, but there was actually a lot of really interesting philosophy and research happening around creativity a very long time ago. I kind of blame the 80s, because people stopped re researching psychedelics. They stopped researching the brain. And now we're back here again, and we're re-researching this. It just took a, like, a generation to get through that whole thing. Uh, and what they were looking for is uh, the number of ideas that people could generate in a set period of time, so they would look at the quantity. I've done this with thousands of people now, um, and it's, I want to be clear, there's an asterisk, it's not mine. Uh, I've, and you hear certain sort of responses, and I could guess probably the main genres of your response. Then they look at novelty, so have they heard it before? And you can argue about if anything is original or novel, but what they're looking for is have they heard it before? Uh, and then depth. I don't recommend a lot of jargon. I will use some jargon today. I'll try to explain how I see it. You get to use your own words at each other and however you want. These are just my little yoga poses, and you get to use what works. A deep idea is, is I think, really well represented by stand-up comedians, where they could take something like a clicker, and they say, ever thought of a... They don't, they, don't, they do proper comedy. This is not proper comedy. Uh, I was looking at a clicker the other day, and then I thought of this, and they add a phrase. And then I thought of this, and they add a phrase. And then I thought of this, I add a phrase. And all of a sudden, the clicker is transporting a, a unicorns through some kind of time portal to another dimension, right? But they go deep and deep and deep and deep. When I run this exercise, usually the first round, people use one or two words. Every now and then there's a brain that is, starts to mess with me and I have to go, shh, shh, you're too, too advanced, you're too far ahead. But usually it's one or two words. And then I point what this is, what, what I, I point out what this is, and we talk about what a deep idea is. The typical answers for the first round of this usually involve violence. Violence, anybody? A little casual Friday night, brick violence. Uh, and maybe that's the only genre of answer. But no, it's, it's, it's more than that. Smash and grab, tie to an ankle, sink people in water, put it under a wheel of a car on the top of a hill, maybe fry an egg, maybe fry something else. But there are certain ideas that you, you hear repeatedly. Now, we, I'm going to give you one more instruction, and I'm going to ask you to do it again. We are going quickly. I want you to go deeper and be silly and have fun and giggle and entertain yourselves. You might have some silly ideas. I just want you to write the longest sentence. Don't worry about syntax. It could be brick-eating aliens arrive on planet Earth and they won't leave until they get the last brick. So we make this new brick and we call it the peace brick and we deliver it to the aliens, okay? Run-on sentence, long sentence. I'm giving you 30 seconds. One more idea. How can you use a brick that does not involve building a building? You've got this. But I know you have it when I hear you laughing at yourselves.
All you're going to do if you're a bit stuck is you're asking yourself questions. That's a brick. When isn't it a brick? When could I make it not a brick? When could I make it the opposite of a brick? What happened if something happened to the brick? And then you're just asking yourself these questions and you answer them. How can I make it sillier? Don't worry about feasibility. Leave that to the feasibility department later. Okay, can I hear, if you're brave enough, two, and I'll repeat them out loud so people can hear them. Could people say to two, yes. I feel like I should come down, I feel, on the court, yes. I'm coming, yeah, what you got? It always feels weird to come out like this, what's going on? It feels overly performative, yeah. what? I have paperweight. Okay, you got a paperweight? Use it like a headgear. Headgear, paperweight. Painting on it. Car painting on it. Use it for karate. So we've got a paperweight headgear karate training utensil tool. All right. Well, I want to hear from Casper and we'll do, I want to hear from you as well, ma'am. What you got, mate? So bricks turn out to be monsters. Bricks turn out to be monsters. I'm going to repeat it. They like being used in buildings. They like being used in buildings. Because it makes them feel special. Um, then when all the buildings are destroyed. When all the buildings are destroyed. They get angry and kill everyone. They get angry and kill everyone. Lots of violence with bricks. It's funny what... I mean, we must think about violence way more than we realize. That's, that's, what, that's the point. What do you have, ma'am? Do I say ma'am? Yes? Raising the height of a table. Raising the height of a table. Not to throw it at someone. Not to throw it at someone. To break another brick. To break another brick. To sit on it when you're not wearing white. To sit on it when you're not wearing white. Is this the one idea? <laughs> or is this like lots of little <laughs> ones? Are, okay, so we're going to put all that together. Yeah, to stand on and feel tall. Okay. There's a, there's a lot going on there, so you give it a name. I feel like we three of us just got married. <laughs> just like, does that happen here? Okay, so that's the brick test. Now, we talked about practice. Guess what? Everything in this room is an idea. How incredible. Apparently, it's really good for your mental health to appreciate things around you. So, if you practice creativity, maybe it's going to be good for your mental health. If you're a bit crazy, like many of the people you've seen speak here this week, you might have to like do that when you're not feeling very good about yourself. But you can practice these things. You could look at anything here and work out what's a weird way to use that thing. It's quite a beautiful meditative thing to do. And then you write it down, you get new ideas, it's practice, right? Taking responsibility for your life and career means you practice your craft. You're not fully formed. That would be the worst thing in the world to think that you're fully formed, especially at 22 or 23, fast track to CEO, then what? Fast track where from there? Nowhere. Practice, practice, practice. That's all you got as far as sanity goes. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. I like to use things that are not involved with advertising. If you think about what these two things are as ideas, and I run you through this, there are a few kinds of answer. In a, group, in a room like this, someone will write a tagline or a slogan, someone will write some vague brand essence -y type thing, like expressing your individual selfishness or something, I don't know. And then there's the main other type of answer, which is a little bit more like a, an engineering mindset where we look at the attributes or the ingredients that make up the idea. So if you invented the pencil, which I usually do by itself, what are the attributes that make up a pencil? Lead? So it's in something? Maybe it's wood, maybe it's not. At one point it was wood, but now it's not. Maybe it's got an eraser, maybe it's portable. And then you use those as the most important features to explain what the idea is in a sentence. Then I often will do pen, and what I try to do, and I know I'm kind of, it's a bit meta, I'm doing commentary on the thing I do while doing it at you. What is a pen? What are the main ingredients? Ink, it's in some kind of container. At one point, ink was permanent. It changes over time. It changed over time. There's a way for the ink to get out. They're kind of the main attributes, right? And I think it's really important to look at things outside of here, again, outside of advertising and marketing. You appreciate the world. Every time I'm on a plane, I'm like, what is this? This is crazy, amazing plane. There's a, I'm on a plane every single time. It blows me away. Now, I'm a big believer. I use the word idea in what I would call a secular way, where uh, in our world, often there's a department that's allowed to have ideas, and I think that that's a very important idea that I respect and honor. However, the other idea that can, that can accompany that idea is that other people aren't allowed to have ideas. But if ideas are bringing things that don't usually belong together, together in useful ways, then I want everybody to have ideas. 
I might want a department to lead a certain type of idea, but I don't want people to turn up and just drift through everything. So maybe someone's organizing food for a workshop. Great. What's your idea? What are you going to do that's going to be a little bit different? And as I said yesterday, to me, planning and strategy, they're creative acts, and we have to own that because it's, you are, we're all creative individuals, and one way to understand it is through the ideas of a non-fiction writer where every single paragraph can have a clean sentence that gets you to see things differently. So that's one way to use it. And the thing is that if people... We use this word all the time in our industry, and then sometimes we're talking about thoughts, which is fine, but we're not talking about ideas so that when you, go, you, when you walk around an agency, sometimes there's multiple brainstorm rooms and workshops happening, and the wall is flooded with like VR and AI and machine learning and this and that, and it's like, they're just thoughts. Why are they even up on the wall? You're embarrassing the wall. Put the ideas up because they're combinations of things that don't usually belong together, and we've got to be accountable for that. Linear thinking, super quick. Edward de Bono, linear thinking is going down a line of thought. Okay, linear, fancy word for line. So you think of Mumbai, there are certain things, apparently traffic is probably the first thing that you would write down, expensive housing, okay, there's a few things that would come down. Bollywood, you get them out, that's linear thinking. And then if we did it again, if we took another topic such as uh, Andrea Pirlo, Italian football, uh, New York, you think of the things that come to mind and you write them down. This is, just how, this is just the brain on a piece of paper. When you cross them, lateral is just a fancy word for cross or across. Lateral thinking is just taking things that don't belong together usually and squeezing them together, hopefully in a way that makes sense in this novel. Uh, and Edward de Bono has a very strong point of view that uh, it's not an idea unless it's useful, which is kind of interesting. This is basically paraphrasing Edward de Bono. I'm sure he was way more elo eloquent, and I've made this point a few times already. All right. Going to show you a rubric, and then I'm putting you to work. So I kind of got to the point where, having moved around a few different places in New York, I was working in places that didn't like process. I was working in places that thought they wanted strategy or planning and didn't. And I knew that because I'd run sessions like this, and I would give them my problem, which is nobody wants to pay for planning and then I would investigate them over eight hours. It was a very, very good way to do research. Uh, and people are really honest. Like, I want to be the smartest person in the room. I don't want someone else in my relationship. I'm like, that's great to know. Appreciate your honesty, global head of group. Um, and so I kind of got to the point where I was like, look, forcing functions. And we've, we've heard behavioral economics come out. I've read a bunch of books on it. I'm not an expert. I've also read about talent. How do you get good at stuff according to science? Deliberate practice, that's kind of one of the main things. Practi breaking your craft into small bits and practicing the most difficult bits will hopefully, get, while getting feedback, will hopefully make your trajectory faster and higher. But I was in all these situations, you know, you, you move to New York, and in Sydney, you kind of all know each other's work, you know what's going on. It's four or five million people, but you kind of know each other's work. You go to New York, and like, you're actually working in Minneapolis, or you're going down to uh, Miami, and you're working with people who they do the strategy because they've done an MBA, and they're like, what is a strategy person even doing in this room? So I was like, look, with the teams I had, I'm like, if you don't want process, or if one place wanted too much process, at least let's try to do this. This is not dogmatic. This is just how I love to work. I don't use it all every single time. This is all jargon, right? It's all jargon. I want to solve a problem. Things like awareness, relevance, salience, all your big words, that's so cool, but like so not useful. Problems are traps. They trigger the creative brain because of survival. We want to solve the problem, get our teeth into it. That's why engineers don't want to work in advertising. They want to work on big problems, even though sometimes those have unintended consequences at some of the tech companies. So we want to understand what the problem is. And then we go inside and, and uh, we'll call it advantage or edge. We clash them together to get to a strategy. So here are the words. Jargon upon jargon right now, but I know how to use it, and that's all that matters. Problem, the human problem behind the business problem, which to me is typically some kind of obstacle and barrier in someone's head. Now, the thing is, a good problem statement could have a solution in it. One of the examples that I like to use is from a convenient chain of convenience stores in the northwest of America in Portland called Plaid Pantry. We ran through some problem exercises with people. We described the problem as because we're assuming a business issue in an audience. I'm not going into that today. We describe the problem as plaid pantry is a place you shop when you're up to no good. Small words, plaid pantry, shopping while up to no good, put them together, that's an idea in a secular 
kind of way. Now, I could see the CEO getting up and saying, you know what? We're the place you shop when you're up to no good. And that's why we've redesigned our stores. They're all dimly lit. Everything's served in brown paper bags. We have secret entrances. Because you, because we were doing it for people at like Wyden and Kennedy and RGA, because you do creative work, and that's really hard. We don't want you to have to feel shame about how you shop. So to me, from a clean problem statement, you can get quite quickly into an idea. But you have to make that decision on every single uh, project. Inside an unspoken, I look for like a human truth. The word human is quite flaccid for me and empty, but I look for an unspoken human truth that sheds new light on the problem. I want connectivity there. Uh, and, and I want it to, yeah, help me see the problem in a new way, based on how the audience sees whatever we're dealing with here. Advantage, what makes the company, the product, the brand, the social issue unique and motivating in people's minds. Okay, you're all familiar with this language. Strategy, I do use exclamation mark just to sidestep like the, what do you mean by strategy, which I can also talk to, but a new way of seeing the business based on all of that. That solves that through that. Simple. You do that, in my mind, you're going to ask better questions. You're going to know why you're asking certain questions. And insight can change a career. It can change a relationship with a client. It can help you win business. It should lead to better work. I hope it leads to better, better relationships with your creative team. You have to make an editorial, or you have to make editorial and team decisions about how far you go as far as ideas, because that all depends on the people with whom you're working. There are no straight up rules here. But what this is also trying to solve for is the frameworks like the four C's: consumer, category, culture, competition. You can have five C's, you can have ten C's, you can use whatever framework you want. But the thing is, a lot of those frameworks travel really, really sloppy. And you get this cliche stuff. I still see it. Uh, consumer truth. Mums are really busy. Okay? Competition. It's a sea of sameness. Uh, company truth. High performing quality endurance and performability of innovation. And then maybe, what's another one that I forgot? Competition. I forgot one. But you know what I mean. Like those things, there's no thread there. And then in the middle will be some nonsense language like deliciously nutritious. No, guys, we did that last time. Let's do nutritiously delicious this time. It's always like four or five syllable words that seem to probably come from French and Latin. I'm like, what is this? Where are my one and two syllable words? And why do you need so many of these big syllables together? We don't get paid by the syllable. Well, maybe you do. I don't know. So this is the rubric. And um, you can look at this one really, really quickly. And then we're working. We've got about 20 minutes, and I'm going to put you to work. I'd like to show you this because this is stupid. This is just stupid. New York Knicks. Business issue, we're going to imagine that they are, their season ticket sales are down. Audience, it's people who followed them for a long time, who resent that they have not performed very well. It's a basketball team. Uh, they resent that they haven't performed very well, and they're not going to give them money. They're kind of holding out. We'll call them the holdouts. Now, what do you do? You go do some research, but you think about who you're talking to. Uh, and like I said yesterday, to me, in the broadest sense, strategy is an informed opinion about how to win. It's informed. It's an opinion about how to win. It's, there is a competitive context there. You go talk to people. And um, I want to point out here that there is, there's some weak language here. But I show my work. I've got nothing to fear because I get the theme. I can work with that. I'm okay with that. Ultimate, it's weak. Best, weak. Self-congratulatory. I don't like self-congratulatory strategy. Hate supporting, maybe it's weak because it's hyphenated. But the point is that I'm making editorial statements, and to me, all those sentences are ideas, right? In, not, in a non-fiction sense. So what's going on? You did your research. What did you find? Well, you know, like, they really love New York. They love the New York Knicks. They're not going to change loyalty. But God, they hate watching them, and they hate supporting them because they haven't done well in 20 years. Okay, cool. Sentence. Insight, the ultimate New York trade is to put up with everything until you snap. Am I right, Farris and Rosie? Am I right? Anybody else lived in New York? Okay, now that is not on paper that interesting, but I could support it through research and proof. Joan Didion, a pretty well-known American writer, Moby. There's a whole genre of, I lived in New York, and I just got fed up, and I usually, they, usually they move to L.A., and apparently sometimes, this is not just you, but sometimes they bounce back to Nashville, I heard. Or they bounce to small, like Portland or Seattle, right? So I can point to culture. That's like cultural truth there. Um, and then, I could, then maybe there's an anecdote that you're on the subway, and it's the middle of summer, and it's 7 p.m., and the trains are full. Super dense crush load. What? You know what that is? 
It's like when the Mumbai trains are really packed. I looked it up. It was on the internet. I was like, that's the best language. Super dense crush load. It's when there are too many people on the train. And uh, you're like, okay, the train's packed. It's really hot. And then the subway, the, the subway car pulls in and the doors open and there's just no room on the train and someone's standing there with a bike and on that bike is a, a baby riding a, a unicorn again, a sparkly rainbow unicorn that's also riding... Uh, I don't know, someone's other child, I don't know what happens. And they're going to get on the train and you can't help it. And at some point, you look around the carriage and you don't know who's going to snap. Is it you? Is it the billionaire? Is it the homeless person? And if you don't snap and you go home, it's just cool. It's just cool. You got through that day. This advantage is really just a way to editorialize a summary of the reasons to believe, the, the proof points that support your argument. It's really expensive. They haven't done very well. People really don't like the owner. The former players have fights with the owner and get kicked off. There's this big thing that went around Twitter about it. I think it was last December or the December before, arguing from the court, a former player. So proof, 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 proof. But that's my opinion. You want me to get a data? Like you want me to get some numbers to support it? Sure. But don't ask me to give you like a data-driven insight, because this is all data-driven. If you know what data is, what you're actually asking for is a number. Uh, and then here, I like these kind of longer strategy statements because what they're not trying to do, if I'm working with a creative team, I'm not trying to crowd out the creative team. I don't like it when people are like, oh, the plan is so good that the planner kind of wrote a slogan in the proposition, single-minded proposition. Cool. It's cool. It's not the job, unless that's what people want from you. So this is a bit clunky, but it keeps me true and honest. Show that the New York Knicks basketball are the best anger management in town. I get it. I get it. My campaign's called Shout It Out. And what we're going to do, the campaign idea is to use basketball from the New York Knicks, uh, basketball players from the New York Knicks around, around New York to cure people's spontaneous outrage, break, uh, uh, outrage breakouts. What does that mean? Well, here we have a former player. There's a particular player who people just got fed up of him running up and down and not trying. Uh, you can throw a ball at him and just get your rage out. Uh, maybe there's a whole series of these things you can throw balls at, and the player that gets hit the most doesn't get to play this weekend. The thing about all of this, though, for me, is where we come to life, and I've realized over the past 10 years that this is idealism that may not have any place anymore in this industry. What if that's a business model? What if that gets us to a new way of being as a business? In the same way that if you took Viagra from brand language of performance, high performance to intimacy, and that brand or the business was about helping middle-aged people or whatever, the, however, whatever we want to call them, middle-aged people rekindle intimacy with each other. What's the business look like? Therapy, do you charge for therapy? Online learning, do you charge for that? What's the role on the pill? That's where this stuff comes to life, but it can also just exist in communications. Uh, and nothing turns me on more than a CMO or a CEO who does believe in brand-led or brand-led business, right? It's beautiful. So, what are we doing? My mullet or Amul? You choose. Amul? I'm curious to do Amul, but I have to trust you a lot as the CEOs of this new company. Oh, it's, the old, it's not a new company. Do you want to do Amul? Okay, so I don't, know the, I don't know the company. I need you to give me a product. Butter, okay. How long has this butter been around? 70 years, okay. Give me a business issue, something to do with some number like sales and stuff. I'm, I'm being disingenuous. Give me, what, give me, imagine a bit, we can either do, do this seriously or we're gonna have, we can have fun with it. Give me a business issue. Are they selling a lot or not enough? Local market? So what's happening? Okay, so there's more competition, they're not selling enough. Now we want to think of an audience. Health conscious, broad. Uh, can you make it a little stranger for me, a little more unusual? Charities? Calories, people counting calories. Okay, so we've got to, and this is pretty broad, but we'll work, we'll work with it, okay? Because you, know you know this company, and you're going to imagine yourselves in this, because you're all calorie watchers. So we've got butter that's been around for a long time. It's not selling as much because there's more competition, and we're talking to people who watch calories. Yeah, cool. So I'm not going to go through all the little frameworks. You can find them on the internet. I'm doing what I would do if I had 15 minutes on this, which is what I've got, 12 and a half. Uh, all we're going to do now is I want you to, all I'm going to do is list about five problems, okay? But what we're going to do is remember the words up there. So you've got to see the problem through the mindset of a calorie 
counter. I'm not going to run you through SWATs and things like that, which you all know. I can get into that. So why aren't these people buying as much from Amul? This is where you interact. I know we're, we're so far away. They have healthier options. They have healthier options, okay. In what way? Uh, there we got yogurt. Thank you. Got whole milk, we've got yogurt. Okay, they're shifting to yogurt. I'll, I'll take that. So for me, a word like healthier doesn't get me anywhere. I can't see it. And I'm, or what I'm going to do for you who run workshops, I, these days, when I was younger, I was a little bit intimidated if you've got senior people. Now it's my room. And what I want to do is take as much editorial responsibility for the words that I use so that every word has some possibility. Because I don't want this workshop to look like the workshop next door. So words like healthy, and what's quite funny is, you all know this, but it's quite funny when people are like, authenticity, healthy, empowerment, you go, what do you mean by that? And they might struggle. They're like, oh gosh, I've never actually had to be accountable for what I mean by that word. And then they think about it. And if they get stuck, you could ask for an anecdote. When's, what do you mean by that? Can you give me an example? And eventually, they're going to give you some normal words. So there's a shift to yogurt. Can you talk to me a little bit? I'm going to take five of these, okay? I mean, maybe I could hypothetically say that uh, most people used to decide what they're going to have for breakfast, basis, whatever sports persons they were following on Instagram, and everybody started moving to healthy options. Okay. So, like, <laughs> I don't know, some so what you're saying specific. Is, so sports people aren't eating butter? Yeah, like every we moved up, it's horrible for health most of the time, so okay. unless it's like fresh. Okay. I'll write this down. All right, all right. Sports people don't eat butter, no longer eat butter. Something like that. What we're looking for here is something that's daring that we haven't heard before, that's also supportable by data. Um, but we are trying to lay a trap for ourselves, something that our brain does want to stew on. Okay. Ah. Uh. What else? Yeah, so what was the first word? Britishness. Sorry, could you repeat? Yeah, I'm saying nutritionist, um, okay. giving, asking you to shift to more homemade uh, alternatives. Okay, more homemade alternatives. What's an example of a homemade alternative? Ghee. Actually, ghee? the ghee which is made at home is a lot of books, I mean, and a lot of nutritionists are actually asking you to have that instead of butter, okay. especially amul butter. I'll just write, I'm going to write making alts as in alternatives at home. Okay, three. Sorry about the user experience of this uh, with the sound. Okay. Yeah, so uh, they don't find the brand uh, aspirational enough to connect with. What do you mean? That's marketing speak. So uh, Amul is a homemade, homegrown brand and they don't want, they want to associate with maybe your imported brand. Okay, marketing speak. I'm being a bully. <laughs> what do you mean? What, I, what I'm trying to do to you is I'm trying to bully you so you get angry and then you give me really short words as if we weren't in a marketing conference. Um. Like just use short words and so it's not aspirational enough. Yeah. Let's go back to that. What do you mean? Uh, it's, it's a brand that my parents used and I want to use a younger brand. Okay. This was uh, the parent problem is also, was also the Levi's problem in, 19, in the 1990s that younger people stopped, apparently, weren't wearing Levi's as much because their parents who are now in their entering middle age were wearing them. Uh, my parents ate it. I'm just going to butcher the language, which is kind of fun. Let's do two more, and then we're going to pick one. Two more. Uh, people turning vegan or preference towards that? Oh, my God. Is it Wizard of Oz. Where yeah, you, yeah. Where's the, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> people turning vegan. It's the new cool thing, maybe. Vegan, yeah. Vegan is cooler. Komal, have you found someone? Okay, one more. Can't get it wrong. Okay. Uh, Amul is cheap. Cheap foods can't be healthy. Cheap, not healthy. Okay. Just one thing. So I just I write these things. That, uh, I'm not saying any language here is great. I like it that it's short. If you do competitive reviews, I really and you have these long decks. 
Okay, we got the word healthy. Uh, if you do long decks, write them like this, so that each slide has like a weird point, maybe in a way that if you write a blog post, you know, that there's like a clear point on every single slide, as opposed to 100 slides of just this big academic pseudo-scientific language. Okay. Uh, by, oh, you have one? Okay, yes. People opting for a regional brand versus a national brand like Amul. All right, they're going, so they're going regional. All right, so now what we're going to do is pick one of these. I don't know if anybody has, does have any numbers on, these, on, on this, but we can use intuition. Oh, this is like a weird game show. Who thinks this is the main problem that we need to solve that would help their business? Okay? I don't know, make some noise, like a clapping noise or something. Two, making alternatives at home. Three, my parents ate it. We've got some alternatives at home. All right, I'll do a little dot here. Uh, my parents ate it. So, uh, uh, vegan is cooler. Oh, what's up, Sweden? Sweden's in the house. Okay. Uh, cheap, not healthy. This is a bit quiet. Going regional. Is going regional like going postal? You know, going regional? Oh, there's a lot of effort, around, a, lot, a lot of noise around vegan. Okay. So all we're going to do now is take that and do problem behind the problem. So what's causing that problem? There are different diagrams that you can use, but again, the diagrams aren't forms that you fill in. It's how the brain works. One of them, which uh, I'm not going to... Oh, hi. Uh, one of them is uh, you, you would take this, this thing here, vegan is cooler, and you could actually write it in a box at the bottom of a piece of paper like this. And then you ask yourself, what's causing that? And you go up. Whatever that answer is, what's causing that? And you go up. Because we're trying to solve the root problem rather than the symptom. There's going to be subjectivity along the way. Maybe you have some numbers. The other one is Toyota's five whys, which is very similar, where you would have a circle, write that in the circle, and ask five whys, uh, the question why five times around it. You could also do it as a mind map, okay? But they're two of the main mental frameworks, they, they're not forms that you can use. So, we're going to do this together. Why is vegan cooler? Sorry? Everyone else is doing it. Okay, so what I want to, so I want to hold that one. Everyone is doing it. Okay. Why is everyone doing it? Because what I want to do is stay on this for a second. Why is everyone doing vegan? Is different? In what way? So a word like different will come up? In what, and I know there are big campaigns that are like, we're different. To me, if you went in, if, I don't know how you meet love interests. I've been with the same person for 22 years. But if you went into a bar to meet someone and just said, hey, I'm different, it's not going to work. It's a really unaccountable way to explain what you're about. It's not a positioning. It's nothing. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean that to say. I was saying it there. I wasn't saying it to you. In what way is it different? It's different because it's not the norm, and by not doing what other people are doing, you're showing yourself as somebody who's taking a different path and therefore showing that, oh, I'm better than you. Different adjective. I don't mind an adjective. I don't, adverbs, apparently. And, uh, replace the word different in the way you just used it. When you're not following the same path, what are you? Noun or adjective? You're not mainstream. You're... you're Could be establishment. rebel. Just use the word rebel. Rebel, yeah. yeah. Everyone is doing it. Oh, hang on. Oh, because they, to show they're rebels. This is going to be a very quick... This is basically how I've had to work for eight years, ten years. Uh, why does... Eat, why is this the case? Why are they rebels by eating vegan? I'm going to do two, see if we can get two more, and then we're just... That's going to be our strategy. Um, how about... They, uh, how oh, hey, about okay. We'll somebody who's very much disliked, like a politician, is um, saying that veganism is bad and everybody is trying to rebel against that. Oh, interesting. Okay, so we could take that. And then what did you have? I like that. Thank you. Uh, so my addition to this was everyone's doing it is because it's against uh, animal cruelty. Yes. And it's the new fad. So yeah. hence everyone's moving to veganism. So... Part of what you, I think you're saying is like it's another tree off this, right? And I just don't know if I've got time, unless you can convert that back into rebel. Like, you could, what you could say is like being a rebel means taking care, right? 
which connects, actually connects to what Cass was saying. So I'm going to shove those together. Yeah? Do, at the back, would you? I see enthusiasm, and I appreciate it on a Friday evening. Thank you. So uh, you can be fussy around friends and then garner attention when everybody's eating together. You can. <laughs> could you repeat that for me? I'm jet lagged, and I was falling asleep before. <laughs> You can be fussy when you're in a gang and you're around friends yeah. about what you can eat and what you can't eat, yeah. which will then garner attention. Yeah, so that's, it's an act of one-upmanship, isn't it? You know, like, no, I got, I got this. You think you're cool, you're playing Fortnite all the time. I don't need butter in your face. So I, I like that, I would keep it separate. My brain for now, for the time, is going to focus on caring is rebelling or rebelling is caring, okay? I feel like that's... It, Oh, so, okay, you uh, go, okay, yes. We were kind of taught like the food pyramid kind of thing and how yep. much dairy you should eat. So that's the establishment. So yep. going against it is kind of, going against the food pyramid is being the rebel. So. Okay, I'll take some of the language from everyone. I hope, I hope everyone feels respected and seen. Uh, going against butter. Uh, I don't know if this is going to work. Okay, going against butter is... Um, one-upmanship is uh, going against butter is, I'll, I'll do this, is an act of caring. Now, one of the most useful workshop tools for insights is people believe X, but Y is true. And if you look at the structure of a sentence like that, it's a lateral thought. It's an idea. And this, this is where we get a little bit confused, because also you could say that the problem statement is an insight. It gets very confusing, right? So, going against butter is an act of caring, rebellious caring, okay? So what is it about that? Because what we're going to try to do is get to an insight and to a strategy pretty quickly, like in 20 seconds. Um, is there a way to look at the idea of caring and butter in a way that might open this up or argue against it? So if you were writing a paragraph, if you were writing a one-page story, you might say, you know, what's, you know what's interesting? We talked to a whole lot of people. Apparently going against butter is like a, this weird act of rebellion. And the rebellion is actually to show that you care and to show that other people should care and that they're crap because they don't care. First paragraph. Then the second paragraph might be something like, but here's the thing about caring about, here's the thing about rebelling, right? Any, any quick thoughts? Build. I'm taking all the risk here. I'm kidding. Any thoughts? You can go away from the cause. It takes very little. It takes very little time for any rebellion to like move away from the cause and then just become about the rebellion. Like a lot of people would accuse that hey, feminism is about men bashing, but it's really not, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, maybe okay. like one thing about rebellion is that it. Okay, so part of that's about taking it too far. But also maybe like maybe this is like not taking it far enough, so you get to make an editorial decision. Okay. Any other thoughts? One more. The thing about rebellion is maybe it's just seen as negative. The connotation is negative with the whole term. Maybe even if it's for a good cause, the term rings a negative bell, brings a red flag. Okay. Maybe. Put yourself in that. So you, I feel like you're out, out, outside observing. Put yourself like. Say it to me like we're just having a conversation. So basically, even if you have to, you know, uh, voice an opinion, you would rather stay away from the whole fact of calling it a rebellion because the moment you say it, people, half of them just shut off because like, okay, it's a rebellion, it's something negative. Okay, okay. So rebellion is negative, although we're saying it's good because that's what they want. Okay. So then there's probably two thoughts that are popping out at this point. One is that uh, you could probably say that it's um, rebelling against butter is... Like, how much of a rebellion is rebelling against butter? That starts to become judgmental. I don't like insights that are judgmental because it's supposed to come from within. Uh, can anybody help me? Can anybody help me? Which go, Casper? <laughs> um, or what we could do in the sake of time is try to get to a lateral thought where we're just going to use these words. We're going to say that show that eating butter is, okay? Show that X is Y. Show that eating butter is what? And I, you know what? You could just agree with this or disagree with it by... We, let's just reverse this, okay? So here's the deal. I'm going to write this strategy statement and then we're going to pretend it's okay. 
we're going to show that eating show that eating amyl butter I don't know if this is true because we haven't talked about the brand and the product itself. Uh, you could say that we could show that eating, this is a bit of an obvious solution to this, but sometimes the solution is in the problem, so allow me to go there. Show that eating amyl butter is also an act of rebellion. Now, I don't know, you know, I would spend a bit of time playing with this and writing and drawing, and I would do this about 20 times in my head and then go for walks and then write three of these little stories up on a page to get to that. But when I think about the mechanics of all this stuff, which is all I've got in a... Like, you're, if you're in an 800-person agency, that's all you've got. You have to quickly look at, is that combining things that don't usually belong together? Have I heard that before? No, no? okay, subjectively, that seems okay. So you could say that the problem that we've talked about is um, people are going against Bada be Going against butter is an act of caring, and maybe there's a strategy to say that we're going to show that eating amyl is also an act of rebellion, and I guess you've got to bring in caring, because that's what's really going on here. So I don't think we're going to solve this exactly right now, but I'll think about it on the plane. Um, the main principles here are really like the freedom to do this. Like I don't, I don't mind if someone looks at this and goes, that guy's really like an idiot, because we don't share our toys enough. Like I feel that just by writing here and playing with you that you feel like psychological safety is super important when you're coming up with ideas, and sometimes our businesses aren't geared to keep crazy people safe, Judge, very judgmental. Um, but this is play, it's fun. It's practice, and part of this is just trying to encourage you to refocus, if you aren't already, to refocus on what matters, which is the thinking stuff. It's not the forms, it's not the timesheets. They're important, you've got to earn money and everything. But hopefully, I don't know if that even makes sense, but uh, I'm going to end it right there. I really appreciate you sticking around on a Friday night. Happy to ask some, answer some questions perhaps over there. Thanks for having me.